Hi, my name is Dr. Alejandra Sanchez Franks. I'm joined here by Dr. Ben Moat. We're both senior scientists at the National Oceanography Center. Ben is joining me to discuss the role of the oceans in the climate system. So, Ben, tell us what the role of the ocean is in the climate system and why it's important. So, if you think about how big the ocean actually is, you know, it covers 71% of the surface area of, of, of the planet. So, that's a lot of ocean in contact with the atmosphere. And the ocean itself, it, it's, it's never still. It's not something that's very static. You know, it moves heat from the, from, the tropical, from the tropical oceans. It moves it towards the poles. So if the ocean didn't do that, I think basically we wouldn't be able to live in the, live in the tropics. You know, we, it, just be, it would just simply be too hot. So the ocean, um, it moves the heat around. It, it's like this, the, the classic like as a, a thermostat of the ocean, you know, it, it, it or regulates the ocean. It, it stores heat, moves it around. And in terms of our, our climate, you know, 93% of that heat, this, this excess anthropogenic heat, you know, the, the human uh, side that, that we've introduced this through the CO2 and the warming, 93% of that is actually going into the ocean. And this ocean circulation is then locking that away and taking it into the deep ocean as well. But it's not just heat, it's carbon as well. So it's pulling that CO2 from the, or that CO2 from the atmosphere is also going into the ocean being taken down. So but, that, so that heat and that carbon that we're talking about, that 93% number you gave us, how are we differentiating that from normal internal variability? Like, how do we know that that's from anthropogenic activity? Right. So how do we know it's us basically? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we know that? Well, it's it's very hard for us to look at the natural system itself in our observations and, and take and split between what's the natural planet cycles and what is just down to this CO2 increase, this anthropogenic forcing or, or greenhouse gases. It's not just CO2. So what we have to do is we need to use these really big couple climate models. So the, these 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 mathematical computer models they simulate the ocean, they simulate the atmosphere, the land, the interactions. And what we can do with them is we can put in, um, we can run it with the scenarios that we see now, or well, the scenario we see now with the warming. And we can run it without that, ex without that increase in greenhouse gases. And what we can clearly see is that you don't introduce those greenhouse gases there's pretty much no temperature change since 1850. And then you put these, these forcings in and it pretty much matches our observations. So with the observations that we use to inform us about the different climate scenarios and simulations, um, what are our challenges? I mean, you and I know as oceanographers, we've, we've only had direct observations of the ocean for, I mean, we're in the, we're in the decades here. It's not, we haven't had observations for that long. So what are our limitations there? What are the challenges? There's the challenges. So, um, we talked about this big ocean circulation, you know, taking heat down, uh, and, and carbon down into the deep ocean, but that ocean circulation, it's, it's not static. You know, if we go back 20 years or, or more, we, we thought the ocean circulation maybe varies on, you know, oh, decay, well, centennial timescales, it may change a bit. <clears throat> but since 2004, we've discovered that the North Atlantic circulation, it varies on timescales of like days to, to months to years. To now to, we're seeing obs the observations are showing perhaps some decadal changes as well. So the challenge really there is like what's happened in the past? You know, we can look at um, paleo records. So by this, I mean tree rings, uh, we're calling it ice cores and to see how that how that's changing but it's putting all these different parts of the observing system together linking that that paleo records with the observational rich period that we've that we've got that you mentioned and really how do we know what's going on in the past and what, what was it like you know we've got sea surface temperature records for instance that go back to actually 1750 made from very early voyages um 
so we can link these up with the paleo records and if we do that in the modern period carry on with the paleo records uh, we've got that line on a, on a figure on a graph and if we overlay the, the modern uh, records we can see that they actually line up quite well which gives us some perhaps confidence that the uh, the paleo records at least within the modern era are doing quite a good job. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the ocean conveyor, ocean circulation, the way heat is transferred in the ocean. And we've talked about ocean observations. What about, what is it like going to sea? I know you've recently led the rapid expedition um, during COVID times. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So seagoing oceanography, um, yeah, lead, leading expeditions, it's it's all a challenge. You know, I could, Let's, start, let's go back in time. You know, my first expedition was in 1994 <laughs> <laughs> in the Indian Ocean. And I was actually an undergraduate at that point. And so firstly, there are opportunities for um, people to go to sea and really experience oceanography. Um, so since then, I've done quite a lot of expeditions in Indian Ocean, Southern Ocean, North, South Atlantic. You know, I've not been in the Pacific yet, which I'd like to do. Uh -huh. uh, Place so um yeah I'll, I'll and sorry to interrupt you but do you mm. find that over that time especially since 1994 and you're at sea and you're seeing in real time uh the observations temperature and salinity um do you find that over time every you know like looking back on the last 10 20 years that you're actually seeing um the changes in the ocean from climate change absolutely on those time scales yeah absolutely so you you can um you make observations in the same place, you can see that warming. You know, again, one of the challenges is, are is how much of the deep ocean, I'm, I'm going back to a previous question, but it's how much of the deep ocean really, how, how is that warming? Because the Argo, the system we've got to measure ocean heat content are one of the systems, you can only get to 2000 meters. So what's happening in the deep ocean? So deep Argo, again, as that becomes more and more of those deep Argo floats come out, we can see the temperature changes in the deep ocean. But yes, you know, you can go to sea, you can make measurements and you can see that it's changing. But even as the, even, uh, even as the general public, all of us, you know, we can look around us and, and, and think, well, how, is that climate changing? You know, if you go back 20 years or more, uh, you can see there's definitely something happening around us. It's, I could carry on about seagoing astrography <laughs> yeah. forever, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, please do. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but it's just fascinating being at sea. You know, you mentioned COVID times. So we um, I was, we were actually at sea. I was leading an expedition off uh, the Canary Islands. And we were heading west in March 2020. The Canary is not a bad place to be. Not a bad place to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, uh, in, in March. But, you know, there was this this whole... A pandemic was just was was appearing and we were just getting bits of news you know we have an internet connection we can see the be uh, see the news etc all the news channels but we didn't realize how how big an impact that was having to society we were just in this in this bubble heading west wanting to do our science and ultimately it was a challenge to um lead that expedition with with, with the people the staff on board that they were quite worried about what was happening at home as was i and ultimately, in the end, we, we turned around and came home, you know. Yeah, I mean, I have the, a slightly different perspective because I was on the, you know, I was on the ship doing, leading the cruise right before the rapid one, which was a hydro section from um, the U.S. Eastern Seaboard, Florida to the Canaries across the Atlantic at 24. And just as we were finishing the expedition, you know, like just a week out, we were starting to hear reports of the pandemic. Um, but not yet worrying because, you know, having absolutely no clue of what was happening on that and because it can be such a bubble mm. being at sea, like it's your own little society. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, even if you go back like now on our ships, we do have a uh, the, the permanent satellite link to the ship. It, yeah. it is slow. It's very slow broadband, but at least we have some method to talk back home to our, fr uh, to our family and, and colleagues. When I first started going to sea, <laughs> there was, I think, one email a drop a day oh, and no email at weekends. Geez. And so if you wanted to phone <laughs> home, it cost you five pounds a minute on a satellite link. Wow. I did a cruise in India once where um, we had to uh, write notes before we left to tell our families that, you know, they weren't going to hear from us for six weeks, basically. 
Wow. It, it's, yeah, yeah. It's strange to hear that in the modern day and age when we've got, we've got all this technology. I mean, this was, two, this was 2016. Yeah, It wasn't yeah. even that long ago. <laughs> um, but getting back to the topic at hand, um, I wondered if you could talk more about what are the knock-on effects of, you know, this, this, you know, the effects of climate change, like heating, deoxygenation, acidification. Um, maybe say a few, a bit more about that. Yeah, so... We talked about the the oceans are warming; they're getting they're getting warmer, uh, and as more of the CO two goes into the ocean, um, we're getting more ocean acidification. So, two of the, these two things together are, are having a big big impact on society. What, what does that mean for the ecosystem? So, in terms of uh, ocean acidification, so it means that the animals that re really rely on um, the, the the alkalinity really of, of the water or the 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 structure of the water to, to create shells around them and corals as well these skeletons that they form it's as we get moved closer and closer to new, neutral ph or move move towards uh, acidity they they're finding it very very difficult to form these shells and also sea surface temperature is increasing so this coral bleaching you know corals are, are, are well, great swathes of the Barrier Reef are just completely dead and gone. There is there is a bit of hope, I think, with the corals. They're, they're starting to um, generate corals that are a bit more resilient to the temperature changes. But ultimately, you know, the animal life in the ocean, they're, they're, they're having to move. You know, the animals are having to migrate. Um, and if they don't, there's probably going to be, um, they're going to, not die out but the possible problems we're going to have with ex some, some animals uh, extinct going extinct perhaps and also animals moving to uh, higher latitudes away from the warmer tropics so with better quality of water we're probably going to see more and more new species around the uk in terms of heat as well we could talk about heat so as the oceans get warmer they're going to expand and expansion sea level rise so towards 50% of the sea level rise we're seeing at the moment is, is from uh, this expansion. The rest is coming from sort of melting of Greenland, melting of Antarctica, uh, and et cetera. But that, that rate of increase of, the sea, uh, of, of sea level, it, it's, getting, it's getting faster and faster because the oceans are getting warmer and warmer. So I think it's 3.4 millimeters a year globally at the minute. But, but that varies around the globe as well. So some regions aren't uh, rising as fast as others. But that has consequences for society. You know, it's not just asking yourself the question, should I buy a house near the coast? You should be thinking about perhaps, well, should I buy a house near that river? You know, we're going to have flooding as well as this, this creeping sea level rise as well into the future. And as, as the oceans absorb this heat, you know, they've, they've got this heat capacity and so they're going to get, um, going to carry on expanding even when we sort out our the CO two fossil fuel problem. So if we start to reduce CO two, those oceans are still going to be have all that heat, and they're going to still absorb more. So it's going to take a while after we reduce our CO two emissions that the the sea levels will start to contract again, or the ocean will start to contract again. What can we do about this? What can we do? Well. As individuals, I will first say there is, there, I, there is hope. You know, we, we can turn this around. If we look at COP26, where we, we are, the trajectory is above the Paris Agreement. But as, as I say, we can do something about this. We can change this. We can do this as individuals, definitely. You know, we can rethink uh, the, way we, um, the way we travel, the way we live our lives. We can start to recycle more renewables you know let, there's a lot of talk about green economy you know let's persuade companies to to manufacture goods that are going to last more than you know for example five years and let's let's persuade them to make them repairable so we're not again waste we're not wasting all all this um these goods by just scrapping them um because manufacturing you know it creates a lot of co2 um don't waste food. There's lots of 
producing food costs again produces a lot of co2 um we can persuade companies as well to to get more onto this sort of green agenda not green agenda sort government of n- government especially government subsidies yeah. i mean we're in the middle of an energy crisis in the uk right now yeah there's so, never been a better time to switch to renewable energy yeah so in technology you know let, let's put money towards technology for renewables we're getting more and more wind power so wind power uh it's i think was it 2016 summer 2016 we actually were completely on renewables for about a month and so that that's great we're doing it we're achieving it but if we can put more um resource into these tidal wind power so wind power we've mentioned but tidal power uh wave power as well so there's a big commodity that the globe could use in terms of wind power so what about the noc and uh our goals towards net zero so as an organization we are working and have been for many many years looking towards greening the way we work the building we're in we have um, these accreditations and we're always we've got champions within the staff as well so we can green we can make our organization um, more well, energy costs a lot of money. So if we reduce our, our, our bills, we can. it's better for the organization and for the planet. But in terms of the science and the, the real goals of uh, the organization, you know, we, we feed into stakeholders. So we, we talk to government. We advise government. You know, we've been, we go to COP26. We work on with, with people from the G7. So we... we we go out there and we tell, educate, inform people about the role of the oceans in climate, the importance, and and we've touched on it. You know what we can do about it. That's a big part of, of what we do. That's great. Thanks very much, Ben. 